very welcome to continue with us our Lenten journey, a series of Lenten talks um, each week. And we have arrived now at reflecting upon the end of Holy Week. After the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist, which we reflected on last week, Jesus goes into the Cadron Valley, into a garden there, the Garden of Gethsemane. There he prays uh, to the Father. And after that, he is betrayed, he is arrested, brought to the high priest, being condemned by Pilate, and walks his way to his cross. So today, we, um, this talk, we reflect upon these events. So let us start with a prayer to allow the Spirit to open our hearts and to be with us on this journey. In the name of the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we really ask you to open our hearts, to walk with you your way of the cross, to walk with you to your agony and pain, but to walk with you to a deeper understanding of what it is to be human, to follow you in your example as you lead us the way, to difficulties and to pain, but towards the resurrection. Please send your spirit in our hearts to really make this union with you more deeper as we reflect on the way of the cross, on your agony and pain towards the resurrection. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So reflecting on the Passion of our Lord is something that can be difficult, I find personally. We can learn a lot of things about it, but ultimately it's something we really have to enter into. We have to enter into what it is to, to, to undergo to a certain extent the suffering that our Lord underwent as well. So we need to enter into it. We need to have a prayerful uh, presence to it. And especially as um, uh, we prepare this for, uh, for the Tridium, uh, the end of Holy Week, but at any time when we kind of reflect upon these things, it is good that we prepare ourselves, that we set some time aside. That especially during the week of Holy Week, and especially the last days, that we set time aside to reflect, to maybe read a spiritual reading, or to, um, uh, to set some time away uh, for prayer, but especially uh, in this that we, we open our hearts and allow these events to kind of enter into our hearts, to allow it to happen. I suppose as a, as a religious, it might be more privileged because we enter so much into all the liturgies and are able to do it. But it is something that uh, maybe we can, uh, in any walk of life, we can facilitate. The whole of Lent is to a sense of preparation for this moment, for this, for this journey, for this, I suppose, highlight of our year as we reflect on uh, the, the way that, that Jesus leads us. Holy Week contains so many things. I mean, it is, it is really, it's a roller coaster. I mean, we have before it, just before it, the resurrection of Lazarus. Many people start to believe in Jesus. There's this huge following, maybe mainly from outside of Jerusalem, but there's a huge following and they, they shout and they, uh, uh, they, they welcome him as he triumphantly enters in Jerusalem with the singing, the, the palms laying out in front of him. All the peoples in jubilee ju uh, are jubilant. But things go change very quickly. If it is the same people or if it is the people in Jerusalem who don't like all this hustle and bustle in their hometown, who, the, for whom all, this, all these pilgrims coming from Galilee and all over the place are just a distraction. But soon he clashes in the temple with his teaching, with the things that he does. And we kind of know that it goes downhill fairly quickly from there. The priests uh, and the authorities are planning to, um, to have him arrested and to have him condemned to death. And to a certain extent, Jesus who knows these things, I mean, it must be difficult. I mean, it says so often in the Gospels that he knows what is in man's heart. So he knew all these things that were going to happen. He knew that some of the people who were shouting and uh, celebrating when he was entering Jerusalem would be the very ones that would be crying, cry crucify him at the end. 
but he knows also our weakness. He knows our weaknesses as we can see in those who follow him, who do not understand him, who might depart from him, maybe come back to him as well. But also disclose uh, disciples who abandon him. It is an emotional roller coaster. And to a certain extent, if we enter into, we kind of feel and sense that if we spiritually allow ourselves to be touched by this week. So we start in the Garden of Gethsemane, after the Last Supper, in which Jesus instituted the Eucharist. He goes down to the Kidron Valley and he goes to a place there that's called Gethsemane. He enters into the Garden and prays there. And we still know the place, what is about, what has happened. So we can still go there. If you're happy enough to go into Jerusalem on pilgrimage, we can go into the valley there, into the Garden of Gethsemane. And we enter the Garden with Jesus to pray. And we do this on Holy Thursday. After the, um, uh, the ceremonies are over, we uh, go and we, uh, we spend time in prayer. We pray with the Lord, we spend time with him. And here we can see the humanity for, of Jesus coming true. And this is really, I think, encouraging because it really shows that Jesus knows what it is to be human. Here he prays, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me, from Luke chapter 22. The humanity shines true. It is comforting to see that Jesus has temptations also to maybe want to divert, find another way, find a way that is easier, to take the cup away. It gives us strength to see that, that he can do it. If Jesus can go through difficult things, if he can uh, withstand the temptations to, to kind of find the easy way out, so we can do. So it gives us courage too, to be able to see, say with him at any time in our lives, but not my will, but yours be done. We can ask our beloved mother, the mother of Jesus, to give us that strength and courage. Because she too had to make that decision. Maybe not as, as graphic and not as, as um, imminent as it is for Jesus, as he knows he is going on his way to the cross. But when the angel came, she must have known that this maybe unknown thing the angel was asking her was not going to be just joyful. But that, as it very quickly after the birth of Jesus transpired, Simeon says that um, a sword will pierce your soul too. That it was going to be difficult. But Mary too said, let it be done according to thy word, to the angel. And this was at the incarnation. Jesus is sweating blood. So this, the, the, this, the, the, the seriousness, the the anguish that is with him. And what happens to his disciples? They fall asleep. So for ourselves a reflection upon our own weaknesses in maybe the times that we do, we do fall asleep in prayer, that we are not as vigilant maybe as we should be. Maybe not with Jesus in this particular moment, but maybe at times that we need to help people or be there for them. But we're not vigilant and we're not uh, I suppose not, not ready to be there um, in the way that we should. So we can pray for the strength to always be watchful, always to be ready to act, to be ready to, um, yeah, to be ready to be, to, to be available for whatever we need to, to con console somebody or to help somebody. And so the same as uh, on Holy Thursday, especially that hour of prayer, to comfort Jesus with our presence to allow us to be with him in this hour and allow in our own lives to have that strength and conviction to say to the Lord, to be able to say, your will be done. Let your will be done in my life. Let me have that strength and that conviction. So towards the end of this time period, this hour, let's say, he goes back and he wakes the apostles. And here now come the guards with Judas, who comes forward to him and betrays him with a kiss. And this must have pierced Jesus' soul, even that he knew it was going to happen. That he knew that, that, that here Judas 
is betraying him with a kiss. But maybe we do that sometimes too. We might not be genuine with people. We might smile at them and, and be cautious, but at the same time we might be talking about their backs or, or do something that takes away from their good name or whatever it is. A lot of these things we can kind of reflect if we take the time and kind of think about them. And do we do similar things as Judas did? Maybe there's something of, of that in all of us. Then when the, the guards come, they ask, Jesus asks them, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he replies with, I am he. Now this is an interesting little detail um, to kind of see. Because when he says, I am he, and it is uses in the Greek the ego eimi, and naturally, as um, Father Louis said last week, he was speaking Aramaic, so we don't know exactly what he said. But this is an indication of the divine name. So he says basically, I am God. And St. John describes that they drew back and fell to the ground. And this force of this, this, this pronouncement of Jesus, whatever it was, because he was using the holy name of God, or the truth that with the conviction that he speaks, whatever it was, it physically pushed them to the ground. The encounter with God can be very profound at times. Maybe not always physical in that way, but even spiritually. And sometimes it's good to kind of think of that. Do we sometimes even encounter, can we remember a moment that we encountered the Lord? That we stepped into a church and just really felt that presence. That we felt the Lord, that felt that the Lord was there. It is a profound encounter and it's something to reflect upon. So they take Jesus captive and then this ties into it. They bring him to uh, Annas and then to the high priest Caphire. And for various false accusations in the two meetings are made against him. But the interesting thing is that the high priest asks him, Are you the son of God then? And Jesus replies again, You say, I am. Again, the ego eimi in Greek. Jesus using the divine name. And of all these false accusations and them going around in circles, and if you have seen the Passion of the Christ, they portray it like the high priest and stuff, a little, the high priest and the people of the, the council are a little bit annoying because this is a little bit of a sham. But this is the defining moment because here the high priest tours his garment, says, do we need, what for the testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips, from Luke chapter 22, 71. Another interesting element to kind of reflect upon at this time is the denial of Peter. Peter denies Jesus three times, as Jesus himself had told him he would. And again, it, it is our humanity, our weakness. While they were asleep in the garden, um, it was Peter who took the, the, the sword and cut off the, the high priest, slave or servant. I mean, again, this, this Peter that is always ready for action and doing something with, the, with the, the, the strength that he has. But here again, he fails to, to stand up for who Jesus is and he denies him three times. But to a certain extent, that is what happens in life. But we should always be able to go back. To cry with Peter as he did, as Jesus looked at him while having been captured by the guards, being maltreated. And Peter denies him for the third time. And Jesus looks at him. And the pain that Peter must have felt. And the tears that must have flowed as he realized that what Jesus told had happened. But the difference between uh, maybe the sorrow Judas fell because he went back to the high priest and, and, and wanted to give back the money. And Peter is that Peter could accept the Lord's gaze of compassion. And at the Sea of Galilee later on, after the, after the resurrection, after the, um, he meets them in the Sea of Galilee, three times he asked him, do you love me? And three times Peter replies, you know I love you, Lord. 
Peter is able to get up and go again and becomes the great leader to bring the church, the early church, and to, to lead it and to allow it to start to spread throughout the whole world. We need to be able to accept God's forgiveness from the times that, that even maybe we have denied him. Not to despair, not to despair as Judas did, but to go back because the Lord gives us that look. This look that maybe says, I told you so. But I think it's more a look of compassion because he knows exactly what we are like because he came, became one of us. And he became one of us exactly to go through what we hear, what we reflect upon here. So the next morning, Jesus is brought to Pilate. And this is, I suppose, where we kind of, this is the things we reflect upon when we reflect upon the stations of the cross. It's a big part of our Good Friday celebration, to reflect upon the way in the various stations to kind of reflect on Jesus going and the elements that, that come to the fore. His falls, his struggles, our own struggles, the pain he must have endured. Simon of Cyrene who helps him carry the cross, the weeping women in Jerusalem, Veronica, who an act of kindness gives her veil and the imprint of his face is on the veil as he washes his face. The meeting of his mother. We reflect upon all these things and we can enter kind of into them and to walk with him. And again, for those who have been lucky to kind of be there and being able to go to the Via della Rosa in Jerusalem, the place, the, the, the route that is Jesus has believed to, to have gone when he was, after he was condemned by Pilate, and once he went out to the place that was called Golgotha, which means the skull, the place of the skull, a rock a protrusion that was left there because it wasn't rock that was suitable to be used for, for building, or also called Calvary from the Latin calva, which means bald head. It was just outside the city walls at the time, although now it is within the old city of Jerusalem. And Golga, Golgotha, the, the place of the skull, is now within the, within the church of the Holy Sepulchre. But we can walk that way. And each Friday, the Franciscans uh, walk that way with the pilgrims to follow the way that Jesus himself walked. So we start from with Pilate, who condemns Jesus, even that he knows that he is condemned because of envy, because of fear, or whatever motivated the authorities. He recognizes something of the truth. He is concerned, he, he is perplexed, but at the end of the day, he still gives in to the demands. Out of his worries for this life, what will Caesar say? What if this rebellion goes on? What does it mean to me? It's much easier to send Jesus off to, to be executed as the people outside seems to, to want, as they shout, crucify him, crucify him, than to do what is right, to follow the truth, to recognize the voice of truth. And a reflection for ourselves. Do we recognize the voice of truth? Do we listen to it or do we ignore it? Do we allow it to speak in our lives? Is it a welcome voice? Or is it something that sometimes we like to ignore? That sometimes we're very happy to listen to, but other times we prefer not to. All these elements must have flashed before Jesus' eyes when it all, all happens. The scourging, the crowning with thorns, the taking up of the cross after being condemned to death by Pilate. All the disciples apart from St. John and his mother and maybe another small group of followers have left him, departed, ran away. 
he is alone. And outside it keeps going, crucify him, crucify him. The betrayal, the pain, the hurt. But Jesus knows why he is doing it. And that gives him strength. And that should give us strength too. We know why we are here. We know why we are journeying. And while, like the three years of ministry, and I'm sure the happy years of childhood and, and early adulthood that Jesus went through, life a lot of times had very good things, but sometimes it has difficult things as well. But we know there is light at the end of the tunnel. We know there is hope. Because it is for a reason. The heavy cross Jesus has to carry. Each step being a struggle. The people on the way who insult him, to shout, who shout at him, the soldiers who maltreated him. But also the little points of light. Veronica who comes and wipes his face. His mother Mary who is there, who gets an opportunity just to be with him for a few seconds. Again, if you've seen the, the Passion of the Christ, it's one of those really emotional moments. When Mary sees Jesus falling at the end of the alleyway, really too far for her to get there. But in her mind, she sees him as a young child who falls, and as a mother, she runs over to him, throwing off, throwing over the tables and um, the water jars and things that are there to get to him, to help him to get him up when he was a little baby. And now so she runs too, towards him and is with him and can hold him for those few moments before he has to continue on. But also the good thief who recognizes who Jesus is and who admits that he is at fault, that he was, um, that he is there for a just reason. But ask for his mercy. Ask for the mercy to be forgiven and to get the promise that he will be Today you will be with me in paradise. Mary standing at the cross. Mary, Jesus' mother. Mary Magdalene, John. They see him as the world around them darkens. As the hour draws near. And at three o'clock then when the lambs are slain in the temple. The sacrifice of the, pa the Passover is being fulfilled. Jesus dies on the cross. The Passover sacrifice. The Passover sacrifice. Him who sacrificed himself. So our sins can be forgiven. And that we can have eternal life. The temple in the, the, the veil in the temple is torn. Nothing is going to be the same again forever. Because through all this pain and through all this darkness, Jesus has achieved what he set out to do. Putting one foot in front of the other. The long journey with the heavy cross on his back. The cross of my sins. One foot in front of the other. He has made it. And he is lifted up. And as the serpent in the desert, if we look at him, we have eternal life. If we believe in him, he will give us life. So this, these few days, especially, but any time, we can reflect on this journey. To walk with Jesus from the time in the garden, to accept God's will, to standing at the foot of the cross with his beloved mother. And to know that this is the way it has to be, to accept the will of God. We can, we can enter into this journey, allow that grace to touch our hearts, to allow it to trans form our own hearts and to accept that suffering is part of this life. But that if we walk with 
with Jesus and with Mary, that we get the strength to do it, that we get a Simon of Serene who helps us, but first, more, uh, first uh, foremostly, that is God himself who gives us the strength to recognize that it is part of life to have these difficulties, but that there is always hope at the end, because at the end is not the end, but is the resurrection. After the, the three days, after we go through Holy Saturday, a day of profound emptiness, if we allow it to enter into our hearts, but then towards the resurrection. And I think especially Holy Saturday is a day that we should have a day of emptiness. I can remember that so often on this day, try to go into a church. I used to go into, try and go into the church before it was open um, uh, and there's nobody there yet. But the Blessed Sacrament isn't there because Jesus is in the tomb and the church feels empty. But this emptiness will be filled with the joy of the resurrection as we celebrate it at the vigil as the Lord has been risen. So enter into this time of prayer. Go into a church on Holy Saturday and allow that sense to be in your life. But not because that is the end in itself. That is not why we reflect, we reflect on the pain and the difficulties. But because we know that we are going to the resurrection. And we prepare our hearts and make that space within us. So that Lord, the Lord can fill us with his joy, with his presence. And that it will change us from the point of view that we know that he is always with us. In difficult and good times, that the Lord will always give his grace, always give us his guidance, and always will help us to lift us up and to bring us along the path that leads to eternity when we are resurrected as well on the last day.